Welcome, everyone. Today discussion on the most important issue. The title is How Politicized Data Sabotages Global Development, Saudi Vision 2030 Insights, which is part of a lecture series of Dr. Turki Faisal Rashid. Welcome back to The Deep Dive. Today, we are really digging into data, specifically those crucial numbers on poverty and hunger, and how these figures, which are supposed to guide policy, well, they often get twisted, moving away from neutral science and becoming, you know, political tools. Exactly. And this is what we call politicized data. Yeah. It's essentially when governments manipulate statistics, maybe withhold them, uh, to push a certain agenda. And it's not just like a numbers game. It really hinders progress on huge goals. Yeah. They think UN sustainable development goals, eradicating poverty. It fuels everything. Yeah, and it makes those income gaps between the powerful and the vulnerable, well, they get even wider faster. It makes sense. If the numbers you use to even identify suffering are messed with, then the help, the resources, they're never going to hit the mark. So our mission today, let's unpack how this distortion actually works. We'll look at examples from, well, all over the Arab world, Islamic countries, the West, it's a global thing. And then figure out what the sources say about maybe uh, fixing data so it actually promotes justice. Okay, let's unpack this. So mm -hmm. fundamentally, when we talk about alleviating poverty, we're talking about distributing resources, right? right absolutely. And distributing resources. Literally. Well, that's always about power, isn't it? Yeah. The sources really stress that politics isn't just influencing poverty data. It's like shaping it right from the core. That's spot on, because deciding who counts as poor, who gets aid that's fundamentally tied into the existing power structures. And, you know, to measure poverty properly, we often use these multidimensional metrics. Um, think Amartya Sen's capabilities approach. Right. Looking beyond just how much money someone makes. Yeah, exactly. It includes things like health, education, housing, basic living standards. But here's the thing. Every single one of those points where you measure it's an opportunity for political bias to sneak in. And how that bias looks really depends on the political system you're dealing with. Okay, so you mentioned different systems. How does that actually play out? How does the politics shape the data differently? Well, let's take non-electoral Arab systems first. Here, accountability often works more locally. So what you see is local bureaucracies um, tending to favor areas that are already influential. Like the capital city or maybe a region where important people live? Precisely. And this leads to what the sources are calling exclusion errors. Exclusion errors. What does that mean in practice? It means the official data just doesn't count everyone who's genuinely deprived. If you're in some remote village with no political clout, your needs get understated. Why? Because the people collecting the data, they're often pushed to focus resources where it matters politically, not necessarily where the need is greatest. Okay, so that's one type. What about electoral systems? You mentioned Indonesia, Pakistan. Right. In those systems, the bias shifts. It's less about local bigwigs and more about targeting, say, swing voters or specific groups that are key to winning the next election. Uh, so it becomes about partisan advantage. Exactly. The government might spin it as effective targeting, but what's really happening underneath, mm -hmm. it often boosts inequality and polarization too, because aid starts flowing based on political usefulness, not purely on, well, human need. That shift from need to political use. Mm -hmm. It's quite stark. Mm -hmm. Is there solid evidence linking political instability itself to these data outcomes, like empirical stuff? Oh, absolutely. And it's a strong link. We look at this big study, 124 countries tying political risks, things like corruption, conflict, ethnic tension, okay. to actual food security levels. And the sources, they show instability causes a measurable drop in food security, a significant one. Now, compare that negative hit from strife with the positive boost you get from, say, the rule of law being strong. Let me guess, the negative impact is bigger. Almost twice as large, yeah. When political stability crumbles, reliable data collection just becomes one of the first casualties. That completely tracks. Instability makes it physically hard to gather good stats, let alone distribute aid fairly. But, okay, this bias we talked about, the political shaping, <laughs> it leads to real damage on the ground. Here's where it gets really interesting looking at specific countries. Yeah, and the picture is often complex. 
Take China's targeted poverty alleviation strategy. Huge numbers, right? Nearly 93.5 million people lifted out of extreme poverty by 2020. That's massive. Sounds like a clear success story. On one level, yes. Huh. But the analysis also pointed out that older problems, like systemic corruption, didn't just vanish. They persisted alongside this big push, which kind of complicates how those gains were actually distributed and achieved. OK, so success, but maybe with some asterisks. Mm -hmm. And what about those electoral democracies? Did that partisan targeting thing actually happen, like in India or Mexico? It absolutely did. The sources we looked at found clear evidence in both places, West Bengal, in India, and Mexico. Partisan goals were definitely prioritized in how relief aid was given out. So people who needed help most might have missed out. That's exactly it. Aid got diverted away from the most desperate simply because they weren't in a key voting block for the party in power. Unfair targeting persisted. Wow. OK, now let's shift focus to conflict zones, because war seems to just amplify everything, the poverty itself and the data problems, especially in the Arab and Islamic worlds. Yeah, in active conflict zones, data collection often just collapses. Yeah. What you end up with are these really stark, sometimes completely contradictory estimates of need. Look, Yemen, the multidimensional poverty rate, it's estimated at 82.7%. 82.7. That's yeah. almost unbelievable. Eight out of 10 people. Eight out of 10 people deprived in multiple basic ways, health, education, living standards. And in Syria, poverty was heading towards 90% by 2025. There, the chaos doesn't just block aid. It also means warring parties use conflicting stats as weapons themselves, you know, to dodge blame for the humanitarian disaster. So the numbers become part of the information war, too. Definitely. And we see similar things even without full-blown war, right? Where political failure meets a big economic shock. You mentioned Egypt. Right. Egypt's poverty hit about 33.5 percent by 2021. This was driven by massive price hikes, a debt crisis. People were struggling for essentials, food, electricity. And the sources suggested that in that situation, the official statistics were likely, well, softened is the word used, massage to hide how bad things really were. Why? To keep up appearances. Mostly, yeah. To maintain an image of stability, probably to satisfy international creditors and institutions. It's about systemic survival when you're drowning in debt. And what about other major nations in that context? Mm. Pakistan, Turkey. Well, Pakistan saw poverty jump significantly, hitting almost 45% in 2025 based on new ways of measuring. And this was fueled by corruption, internal shocks. Meanwhile, in Turkey, there were actual allegations and evidence of financial data being falsified. Not just tweaked, but falsified. Yeah. And reportedly, this wasn't just about making the economy look better. The manipulated data was allegedly used politically to target critics, all while, you know, nearly 12 million people were facing extreme poverty by mid-2025. But here's the really crucial takeaway, and the sources emphasize this, this kind of manipulation. It's not just happening in authoritarian states or war zones. It affects countries that we often think of as champions of free speech and open information, too. Which brings us squarely to the West. And it seems like when a nation's self-image or core political interests are on the line, the commitment to data transparency can suddenly evaporate. We saw a really stark example in the U.S., didn't we? We absolutely did. September 2025, the Trump administration stopped the USDA's annual food insecurity survey, halted it. And the reason given? The official line was that the survey itself had become overly politicized. But calling it politicized and then stopping it, that had an immediate, very real effect, right? A critical one. Oh. It instantly hid key trends in hunger across the country. And maybe more importantly, it obscured the direct impact that recent cuts to aid programs were having on people's lives on the poverty stats. So remove the measurement that might show your policies aren't working? Essentially, yes. Mm -hmm. Remove the data point that directly contradicts the narrative of, say, economic success you want to project. And this pattern? Hiding, suffering to justify policy. It wasn't just the U.S. We saw echoes in the U.K. around austerity, yeah. according to the sources. Yeah, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown spoke very powerfully about it. He described the child poverty crisis there, not with stats, but with these really vivid pictures. Okay. Tables without food, bedrooms without beds. Wow. Homes lacking basics, heating, cooking utensils, even soap. It really highlighted this kind of silent, deep suffering caused by austerity, the kind that official government numbers often just gloss over or maybe intentionally miss. So pulling this together, the pattern seems clear. Politicization of data isn't about left or right, democracy or autocracy. It happens everywhere. Whether a government wants to look strong internationally, like maybe in Egypt, or justify tough domestic cuts, like in the UK, 
Manipulating or hiding inconvenient data seems to be a universal political tactic when key interests feel threatened. And if you zoom out and look at the wider damage from all this tampering, beyond just the politics, it really hits hard in three main ways. Economically, first. Data risks, uncertainty. That scares off investment. And there's even a link shown between corruption, often tied to this lack of transparency, and slight drops in average caloric intake. Small individually, maybe, but adds up nationally. Okay, so economic impacts. What about socially? Socially, it's incredibly damaging. Skewed data means aid doesn't reach the people who need it most. It deepens poverty traps. And according to things like the World Value Surveys, it fuels social polarization because people see resources being allocated unfairly and trust breaks down. And the third area, sustainability. Yeah, sustainably. <laughs> Especially in fragile states or conflict zones, this kind of data manipulation basically makes achieving those big UN Sustainable Development Goals almost impossible. The foundation just isn't there. It definitely sounds pretty bleak, but the sources do offer some ways forward, some solutions. What are the main things that can push back against this distortion? Well, the core counterweights are transparency and strong democratic institutions. But more specifically, first, we really need global standardized ways to measure poverty that are just harder to fiddle with. The Multidimensional Poverty Index, the MPI, is a key example. Why is that harder to manipulate? Because it looks at a bundle of concrete deprivations, health, education, huh. living standards, not just an income line that a government can easily redefine whenever it wants. Right. It's harder to pretend a school exists if it doesn't or that people have clean water if they don't. Verifiable things. Exactly. Yeah. Verifiable realities. Second, we have to empower civil society, groups on the ground, independent organizations. They need support to collect their own data. Think of projects like Jordan's Arab Barometer. They provide a crucial check on official statistics, uncovering problems the government might ignore. Ultimately, the goal is to get governments, international bodies, and local communities working together so the statistics actually serve the citizens, not just the state. On that note, thinking about government action... The sources brought up Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030, kind of an interesting counterexample in the region, a government trying reforms, but also using data-driven programs to cushion the blow. Yeah, it's mentioned as a case where even while making tough economic changes like cutting subsidies, which can really hurt people, yeah. they simultaneously launched this big program called the Citizens Account, Hisab al It started back in 2017. And what exactly does that program do? It's basically a huge national cash transfer system designed specifically to give direct financial aid to people, helping them cope with rising prices from those same reforms. And it's been pretty substantial. We're talking over 100 billion Saudi reals, so it's about 26 billion U.S. dollars, distributed to around 10 million people. And it got extended into 2025. So a direct effort to use resources to mitigate the immediate impact of policy changes. Right. It shows a focus on using data and resources proactively during an economic transition. In the public reporting around Vision 2030 itself, the sources mention accessible analysis showing progress. Yeah, things like hitting 93% of targets across hundreds of initiatives, unemployment dropping significantly down to 3.2% in Q2 2025, apparently, and homeownership rates climbing past the 2025 goal already. Which suggests using metrics for public accountability, tracking progress against stated goals. It points towards that model, yes. Using data to show movement toward defined public objectives. And bring this all back to the big picture, data manipulation isn't just some technical issue for statisticians. It's deeply tied into global inequality and conflict. The sources kept showing how these poverty violence cycles in places like Egypt, Yemen, Pakistan, they're directly fueled when data gets politicized. When people feel their government is actively hiding their struggles, that breeds instability. It's almost inevitable. So what does this all mean? I think the big takeaway here is that the numbers we rely on to understand suffering, well, they're incredibly vulnerable, easily captured by power. We just can't take an official statistic at face value. The real keys seem to be pushing for transparency, adopting robust global standards like the MPI that are harder to game, and critically, empowering civil society people on the ground to collect independent data. That seems like the only way to make sure data actually serves people, not power agendas. And that leaves us with a really important question, something for you, the listener, to think about. The sources sort of hint at shifting our focus maybe moving away from just the headline statistics, the fanfare around numbers, and focusing more on the shared human stories behind those numbers, using stories as a bridge. So the question is, how do we make sure those stories, the real experiences of suffering, aren't silenced by manipulated data? 
especially when governments might try to suppress them, maybe using things like national security excuses, formal requests like D-notices, asking media to hold back. How do we protect the human experience from being overwritten by politicized numbers? Maybe prioritizing those stories is actually our strongest defense against the weaponization of statistics. Stick around for timestamps in the description. A QA at any time.